You're listening to the Holistic Nootropics Podcast, your home for holistic, evidence-based cognitive enhancement strategies. Hey, welcome back to the Holistic Nootropics Podcast, where we talk about using nootropics, nutrition, and biohacking to help you hack the power of your brain. My name's Eric. I'm a functional nutritional therapy practitioner. And today on the podcast, I have Dr. Gio Espinoza. Dr. Gio is a naturopathic functional medicine doctor recognized as an authority in urology and men's health. He is faculty and a holistic clinician in urology at NYU Langone Health and faculty for the Institute of Functional Medicine. As an avid researcher and writer, Dr. Gio has authored numerous scientific papers and books, including the best-selling prostate cancer book, Thrive, Don't Only Survive. He is the chief medical officer and formulator at the male Focus nutraceutical company, X. Y Wellness, LLC. Dr. Gio is the co-founder and writer of the popular male health website, drgeo.com. Dr. Gio, welcome to the Holistic Nootropics Podcast. Hey, Eric. Thanks so much. I'm so happy that we're able to make this happen. Thanks for reaching out. I'm looking forward to our interview here. Yeah, I'm actually really excited about this podcast. Really quick, before I start jumping into the podcast, just want to let all the people watching out this, the millions of viewers out there, that if you are enjoying this podcast here with Dr. Gio, we have a whole library full of podcasts here, Holistic Nootropics. If you dig this sort of thing, hit the subscribe button, give us a like, and as the conversation goes on, leave a comment, share it with your friends. Let's make this thing grow. Let's get into the podcast. Um, so Dr. Gio, I'm excited to talk to you because you are an expert in men's health. You were telling me a little bit off camera, you have an office full of penises. And so I want to talk to you about, about all things men's health. I want to talk about how it pertains to mental health. I want to talk about how it, you know, the things that you see in your practice. But yeah. before we get into all that, I want to ask you, how did you become a specialist specifically in yeah. men's health? It initially started by me. So I went to naturopathic medical school and uh, towards the end of that training, you have to do clinical internships. And um, during that training as a, as a student clinician, I just started seeing a lot of men for some odd reasons. There's no really rhyme or reason. I mean, uh, most men wanted, there were all other male uh, student clinicians there. I just saw a lot of men. So, okay, cool. I was resistant to the idea of just doing men's health because, you know, particularly at the time, yeah, no men don't go see doctors. So why would you want to see men and th those kind of um, uh, that, that kind of uh, thinking that was prom uh, 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 prominent at the time? And then I did a, a internship with a urologist. So, you know, the urologist is the male gynecologist, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, so I did an internship and I said, well, this, I like this. Um, and then I, then I, then I did a, a, a fellowship, um, and a training at Columbia university at the department of urology. And again, my focus there though, again, so, you know, females have urological problems, but again, urology is almost always associated with men's health. Um, I became fascinated with, you know, learning about the prostate and different prostate conditions and. Uh, different methods of treating these prostate conditions and learning about erectile dysfunction and really going deep into why does that even happen? Then sort of, I, I always start in, in, you know, we always start in the pelvic area, then expand to make sure that the guy's doing well you know, overall, not just from a prostate and penis. And, and then um, the, it became fascinating to learn um, that, you know, as you talk about nootropics and we will later, Men rather die than lose their memory or have dementia or have Alzheimer's. I mean, it, it, there's numerous men that have said that to me. The only reason I say that also is because I do see in my practice men with prostate cancer who are undergoing hormone deprivation therapy. So they get chemically castrated, right? Mm -hmm. Zero testosterone. Testosterone is a, neut a neutrophic. Mm -hmm. So the, one of the biggest fears, and it's associated with ADT, androgen deprivation therapy, is dementia, loss of memory, or even if there's a predisposition to Alzheimer, Alzheimer's, that, that increases the risk of Alzheimer's. So I see a lot of these men. So again, this is part of the conversation. So I just became fascinated. The other, the other thing is I became fascinated because I'm a man, right? So I'm like, how do I function? And why do I feel like this or like that? Or, you know, you know, you know, how do, how do erections work? I'm really getting down to the science of, of all this. And so if I know how it works, I'll know how it doesn't work. 
And, you know, I always say the penis is the barometer to a man's health. So while it's there for quality of life and, and, and conception, to me, if you tell me and you're my patient, yeah, doc, you know, Dr. G, I haven't had an erection in six months. Red flags, red flags are coming up in my, like what other systemic problem is happening here, right? So um, it, it, it was, so I, I just continuously became fascinated. I think we were talking offline. I'm still fascinated. I've been in it for like uh, tw almost 20 years now. It doesn't cease to amaze me how the male human body work, the biochemistry in men, the hormones in men, you know, the pro you know, there's three things that makes us different from women, right? Uh, we have a penis, women don't. For the most part, things are changing now, but for the most part, Men have penises, women don't. Uh, men have prostates, right? Women don't. And men have 20, 30 times more testosterone than women. Those are the three things that make a man a man and a woman a woman. So these are the areas that really fascinate me, those three areas quite a bit. Yeah. And, that, you know, um, it, it just developed a life of its own. I, you know, it, it, it really, I always say this, this found me. I didn't look for it. I was resistant to it um, and sort of, it found me uh, and I just became immersed into the whole thing. Yeah. And as you were talking, I was just kind of thinking about, um, cause you said you've been, you've been doing this how, how long, 20 years. Yeah. I'm afraid to admit, but almost 20 years, 20. Okay. And I'm just thinking about like 20 years ago, 25 years ago, nobody talked about men's health, you know, like men's no. health was always considered like, okay, we're, we're either bodybuilders or, you know, we're just not into it at all. You know, there is no, like, right. there, no, no, we never talked about hormones. We never talked, if anything, it was like, you weren't a man if you didn't drink a manly beer or eat manly food or do manly things. And the, the funny thing is, is like, if you drink beer, that's going to lower your testosterone. You know, there's certain foods or certain activities that like, you know, it doesn't prove your manliness or not, you know, if you, if you wear a certain cologne that could be, have endocrine disruptors in it alone, you know? So it's yeah. like, yeah. Uh, it, it's like the conversation hasn't even begun. Meanwhile, it's like the women are light years ahead of us in the wellness space. You know, they, they're like doing the yoga. And then if you're a guy, you yeah. want to do yoga, you have to like sneak into a yoga class and you have to be real quiet and stay in the back. So I think what you're doing is amazing and, and you're probably could, could be considered a trailblazer in it. Uh, thank you. You know, you, you know, talk about um, men uh, not wanting to talk about men's health back 20, 25 years. You know, as a natural doctor that looks for natural methods to help my patients and people get better, I do have a level of fondness for some pharmaceuticals. I think that um, drugs like Viagra, if anything, opened up the conversation. Before Viagra, um, it was considered impotence. So men didn't talk about impotence why would you talk about impotence with anyone that's uh you know you that that you're that's shameful after the the advent of viagra um they they had to create a diagnosis so that they can you know code it and prescribe it and it became erectile dysfunction oh erectile i'm willing to talk about erectile dysfunction yeah sure and then you'll have a, you, so then after the advent of viagra men became more open to talk about things like now the the issue with the whole thing is that you know Viagra or Cialis or any PD five inhibitors those are bad days. They are not they're not addressing the cause of erectile dysfunction. Still and all, it opened up the conversation, and I think that um, I, I think that's a really good thing. Absolutely, and you know, talking about erectile dysfunction, um, you know, I understand it as an issue with uh, um, with like vascular health correct? Like, uh, with blood pressure and things like this, and, and it's all connected. Um, meanwhile, a regular doctor, unlike someone like you, isn't telling the patient or telling the guy, you know, Hey, like we should look at your cholesterol. We should look at these other markers. Uh, just take the pill. Meanwhile, you probably go, well, let's, let's look at some labs. Let's see what else is going on with your blood work, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. So the workup is, is essentially looking for and trying to, um, trying to rule out metabolic syndrome, right? So metabolic syndrome is when there's three of, uh, at least three things happening, uh, where they have, let's say, a big waist uh, as it relates to their hips. They have big bellies, uh, high blood pressure, um, high LDL, 
what's known as bad cholesterol, low HDL, good cholesterol, high triglycerides, uh, high blood glucose, high hemoglobin A1C, any of these three things that would be considered that they have metabolic. So metabolic syndrome is one of the main things that's contributory to erectile dysfunction. So absolutely, um, men with erectile dysfunction have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, right? So yeah, we look at these things. It's really the stress level, um, stress level. Um, are you really into your partner, right? Are you really, you know, or are there issues there that you may need to address with your partner, right? That's important because good relationships are good for, for good health. Unfavorable relationships can, one can argue that is contributory to bad health, right? So these are the kind of things that we dig deep. And of course, many of them, hey, I just want to function. Okay, fine, no problem. Maybe we use a PD-5 inhibitor. But understand that when you're coming to me, we're looking for the cause of the problem. Uh, we want to make sure there's no cardio, there's no uh, vascular issues that your uh, uh, vessels can dilate and constrict, dilate and constrict. That's what uh, that's what it's supposed to do, um, and so that blood can flow in. And again, it's a reflection of how your blood vessels are working outside of the pelvic area. So yeah, that's it's it's a process. It's not an, at least with me, it's not a, a matter of you know here. Uh, take that. Let me know how it works. Absolutely. Yeah. And geeky question alert. What is P yeah. what is a PD five inhibitor? Right. So when, so let's reverse engineer an erection here, Eric. Um, so my favorite yeah, thing to do ever end. on Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs> so at, at the end, ultimately what's required is for blood to go into the, um, what's called the corpus carbonosum. These are the two cylinder like muscles in the penis. And this little tiny uh, arteries called arteri arterioles in there. And those arterioles need to fill up with blood. And when that fills up with blood, men get an erection, right? If they can't fill up with blood, obviously the opposite happens, right? So how does that process happen? Well, that's a long you know, process um, where the body uh, uses arginine to stimulate the production of nitric oxide. Mm. It's a gaseous chemical in the, in the arteries. The, the, the nitric oxide then, so what do you need? You need nitric oxide. Sometimes there's not enough nitric oxide in the body that could be nutritional, that could be many things. So you need nitric oxide. Then with, when, that, when nit nitric oxide is produced, then that causes a, 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 a release of what's called cyclic GMP, CGMP. CGMP causes the arteries to dilate and constrict or, or dilate in this case, right? So you need CGMP. Phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor works by stopping too much production of CGMP, mm. right? Because you don't want to have an erection for, I'm assuming most men don't want an erection for three hours. Although most men would like one, it's not, right? That's, uh, an erection for more than three hours is really a heart attack to the penis. Yeah. Right. It, you will have permanent erectile dysfunction if that happens. So drugs like Viagra, Levitra, and Cialis inhibits the production of, 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 of phosphodiesterase inhibitors, PD, PDE5s. And by doing so, it allows more CGMP in the arteries. And so you get an erection and you keep an erection for longer. Okay. So then is, cause I do hear a lot of guys supplement with something like arginine, but I've also heard that you don't want to do that. Or if you do that, you got to pair it with another amino acid. I feel like it's L ornithine or something like that. Um, so it's, it's citrulline. citrulline what you're thinking yeah. about it citrulline. And so me personally, I don't use arginine because I think not only do I think science shows that if you want more arginine in the system, then you want less oral arginine and actually more cyst uh, more citrulline. So I really just use citrulline in my practice. Got you. And and nitric oxide as well. I don't use nitric oxide. Some people. So in some EB for uh, male spectral supplements, you have beets and things that kind of produce nitric oxide. Um, if you have enough citrulline, you should be good with your body's ability. Unless other things are funky and not uh, and are off, but Citrulline is one of the main things that you want to 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 give to ha get enough nitric oxide in the body. Got you. 
So let's 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 talk about testosterone. Um, and I think it's pretty it. cool. You you said testosterone is a nootropic. Why do you believe that? Well, it, I don't know that I believe that or that I know that. Um, so in a practice such as mine, um, I have the ability. So one thing is, as you know, Eric, um, I'm training. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm bouncing around, but we'll, we'll bring it home. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is ADD I, I, theater. I'm all for it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, maybe, I, maybe I need a new trophy. Like, I yeah. You're the right um, channel. <laughs> My name, so I have a garage gym and, um, and, uh, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not a personal trainer, but my neighbor who's a middle-aged man, he's now 56. Yeah, he's been coming for the last four years with some level of consistency and we've been, we've been training together. Right. So he's like doubled the weight of his deadlifts. He's like, you know, he's much stronger than he ever even imagined as he gets older. Right. This is what it should happen with men, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And he says to me, you know, are you, am I a guinea pig to you? Like, did you know that you can do this with me? I said, well, in reality, I've been studying anything that has to do with strength, anything to, for men to live longer and better. And part of that is strength training. And plus I play football and I like lifting weights and I like to go and geek out into the science of all this. So in, th in theory and by learning, I've been doing this for, I don't know, between my own 30 years. But actually applying it, I'm not a personal trainer. So you're the first you know, such case. And it's, you know, I've just been talking about it. So going back to your question with testosterone, um, it's not just, you know, reading and sounding good in cocktail par at, at car at cocktail parties. I'm actually seeing what happens on a day to day. I see men that, you know, that are juicing. Some of them are even bodybuilders, testosterone 3000. And I'm seeing other men whose testosterone is like zero because they're on ADT for prostate cancer mm. and i can see firsthand what's happening to these men and how they behave you know as their hormone levels change mm -hmm. it is pretty remarkable testosterone as a nootropic so i see men on adt who if they're not careful they start having memory lapses that was not there before and real quick what right? is AD, what, sorry what does adt stand for so a a ADT stands for androgen deprivation therapy. Okay. So that's Sorry. chemical castration. Uh, uh, that's that's medically induced chemical castration. Wow. For advanced prostate cancer. Yeah, and that's because you have to lower the testosterone with an with a prostate issue like that, or with that uh, in, in with advanced prostate uh, cancer. That's one of the main therapies is to chemically castrate. Got you. Yeah. So. I, I see what happens and they tell me, look, I feel like I'm, my memory is waning and it, it's in the literature too. So yes. So testosterone um, um, is, is, is a nootropic. It helps with and enhances brain function. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, so this is why it is important for men to get their testosterone checked and see if it's an, and, and, you know, and, and sometimes men have no symptoms of low testosterone, zero symptoms. And they have low testosterone. So it's always when I'm teaching to clinicians, the question comes up. And really, sometimes the debate comes up. If I have an asymptomatic patient in my office with low testosterone, do I treat, the t you know, do I treat them with testosterone? Right. And I think that the, the answer normally is, well, let's try to see if we can stimulate the production of testosterone naturally. And let's do that first. And there's many ways to doing that. And if not, maybe depending on what they're willing to do, maybe with some mild therapeutics, pharmaceutical like cl uh, clomiphene, which stimulates the brain to produce more chemicals to produce testosterone, things like that. But anyway, uh, uh, before I continue on, um, uh, yes, testosterone is a very important component to, to brain health. I think, you know, the, the little bit of research I've done in this area that, yeah the conversation of testosterone, man, it gets so, it, it, I don't want to say politicized, but it gets so yeah. just wrapped yeah. around this kind of yeah. idea of like toxic masculinity. Like we think of testosterone yeah. and it's like, Oh, I'm a dude. I'm angry. Yeah. But 
if anything, yeah. it's the exact opposite. It's like testosterone yeah. keeps you level. I mean, it makes you feel like yeah. a dude and it makes you feel like a man and it makes you want to do manly things and it gives you energy, but it also winds you down. It chills you out. It helps you get to sleep. It helps your memory. You know, it yeah. helps you from not being a total douchebag. Um, yeah. So like, w what do you see as clinical symptoms of, you know, from like a personality perspective of low testosterone? Anytime you have an extreme change in, 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 in a major hormone, like whether it's estrogen in women, the, the, you know, when they reach menopause or testosterone in men, whoever they are prior to, it, 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 it exacerbates by like 10 times. So if a guy's a, an aggressive person, if he goes on zero testosterone or a lot of it, he becomes more aggressive. Right. Uh, if the guy's a good guy, uh, if, if he's like a, a gentle person, if he's like um, uh, 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 a, a um, someone who is emotional, then if they go to zero testosterone, again, likely from ADT, they, they're very emotional. They, very, they get teary eyed very easily. If they get a good amount of, uh, of testosterone, they not necessarily become more aggressive or more emotional. Necessarily. You know, they, they, they become a little bit more emotional in a more masculine energy way, if that makes any sense, not necessarily in a um, crying way, but they become emotional. They want to take action. Um, if their daughter is in bad shape, they want to do anything for their daughter, even you know, anything. And they get sentimental about their child, if you will. So the emotion that they would have normally would be more of that with any drastic change in testosterone. That's, that's kind of what I find. So, you know, testosterone and most hormones uh, and neurotransmitters in the body, you know, too much of a good thing is not a good thing. So you want it at a, at a healthy range, I think. Yeah, that's, I mean, um, I love the word modulate because it's like, so yeah, that's a great word. Yeah. it's not like enhance. It's not like decrease. It's like, just keep it, just keep it right. You know? Um, yeah. and if, so when you said, like if someone comes in your office or P, uh, or other doctors consult you like, Hey, what do I do with this, with this patient or whatever? And you mentioned you give them something for testosterone, like in your case, what, what, what is that? What is that suite of options that you're working with? So again, we try to, um, stimulate the production of testosterone naturally. Okay. So that looks, you know, the way, what that looks like is, um, some, uh, so we have, um, um, for example, Eric, you know, you, I can have a, a, a marathon runner, an endurance, an endurance athlete come to my office, right? So they run, I don't know, 50, 60 miles a week. What they're doing there is they're increasing their t cortisol way too high. And cortisol is problematic for brain function and testosterone production or too much of it, right? You need some cortisol, but sometimes the cortisol is through the roof. These guys are burning the candle uh, on, on both ends at both ends. And, and, and so they're overdoing it. So what I would say in that person, and I've had, I had a, I just recently had a 19 year old with low testosterone and he's like a lacrosse player and, and he trains two hours after practice. And he's like, look, I'm in college and uh, you know, I can't even, I'm afraid to be with girls and his testosterone is low. Um, and what ha what's, and his cortisol is high. He's he doesn't sleep well, um, so you know. So so then that's the issue there. Um, so you have to treat. You, you have to look at their lifestyle. Sleep is another component. You need good sleep to make to you know. To, you, your body produces a lot of its testosterone roughly around four or five o'clock in the morning, mm. and then it's increased it throughout the day. So. So there's a, there, your body's testosterone fluctuates. Like when you go, when I ask my patients to come for a blood test for testosterone, I try to have them come in at 8 a.m. Mm. That's the best time to get, a, as opposed to, I don't know, 4 p.m. Right. We may not get the right, it fluctuates throughout the day. It's very cyclical. So, 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 so there's, but you need proper sleep to get that good testosterone at, you know, 4 or 5 a.m., right? Um, then there's, uh, so going back to exercise, I have them tone it down with the, 
you know, endurance exercise, or sometimes they don't exercise at all. So we try to ramp them up. And really, it's weight resistant training. It's working out big muscles like back and legs. Um, it's it's really what it is. And then some nutraceuticals. Um, you need to earn vitamins. Uh, you need zinc, uh, for example, to to get good testosterone. You need uh, certain botanicals that I use, like ashwagandha, um, a group of category of, of botanicals called adaptogens, uh, are very good because it modulates. Uh, cortisol, <laughs> right? Great word. It is a good word. You're Such right. a good word. It's a great word. <laughs> top, top, top ten. Top, top easily, ten easy. It's breaking through, no doubt. You know, I like to, I, I like sequela quite a bit too. Sequela, okay. as right? a word or so as a as a supplement? As 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 a, no. <laughs> I don't know what that <laughs> is. <Great question>. <laughs> <laughs> I like it as a word. So it's been used lately with COVID nineteen. So when people have a sequela of events. Mm. After COVID, like long haulers, they have all these other symptoms. Mm. The, the word is sequela. I'm like, I, I like that word. I like sequela. Like okay. sequence. Right? Yeah. I don't think COVID yeah. long haulers like it, but yeah, it's a, it's a very right. nice word. No, well, they don't, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, anyway, so that's, that's, a, that's pretty much what we try to do. We try to get their cortisol down. We try to get them to sleep better. Really healthier habits. And with healthier habits, they tend to... You know, they, their testosterone. I mean, I've increased testosterone by 300 points, no problem with natural methods. Wow. So, yeah, that, that is a big deal because if you went from 300 to 600, you feel it. Yeah. And the, the interplay of testosterone and cortisol is so fascinating, which is why it's interesting that you said that testosterone peaks four or five in the morning. Because I thought that cortisol was peaking at that time. And if cortisol yeah. is peaking at that time, then I didn't think testosterone could work together with cortisol like that. So I'm so wondering cortisol, how that... Cortisol is peaking a little later on, maybe two hours later, like okay. when you wake up. Um, as opposed to testosterone is literally like, three, like 4, 5 a.m. Cortisol is like 6, 7 a.m. Mm. But here's the thing. And this is very important because people, oh, I don't want any cortisol. Men, I don't want any estrogen in my body. I want zero estrogen. No, no, no. You need estrogen. So it's not a matter of, hey, wait a minute, cortisol speaking or testosterone? No, no, no. It's the amount of cortisol that's, you know, peaking versus chronic high cortisol throughout the whole day, right? Particularly at night when now you can't sleep. So that's the issue in general, but, and that's also the issue with, as it relates to testosterone production. So I wondered then if maybe like testosterone, because I know your REM sleep is peaking about yeah. that same time, four or five. So I wonder if yeah. testosterone, if you could almost read your testosterone yeah. just from knowing like how your REM sleep is. Very likely. I think so. I mean, I wear my wearables and my aura ring. Um, yep. <laughs> I see. <laughs> yep. There we go. So, uh, I don't know. I, that is what in theory, I think it's happening. Um, I haven't quite studied it with a, a, a gadget like an aura ring and kind of seeing and measuring testosterone early in the morning and comparing that to their REM sleep. I haven't quite done that. That would be a very neat thing to study. Yeah. And while you were talking, actually, speaking of the aura ring, I was thinking like, have, are there any, is there any research into something like heart rate variability and testosterone? Any interplay right. between those two? Because you're, you're mentioning no. like something about the the workout and the stress and yeah. you know I'm, I'm thinking like the aura ring doesn't do this but like i know the whoop strap will tell you like here's your recovery yeah. and you know so and heart rate variability plays in with that you know there there lies another theoretical component i think there's something there but i haven't seen research on heart rate variability as it relates to testosterone heart rate vari variability is fascinating to me because that really tells me really what it tells me is how healthy is the central nervous system, right? And yeah, and I think there is absolutely, you know, if somebody's constantly in a sympathetic mode, then, um, then they're going to have low testosterone because they're, they're producing a lot of cortisol throughout the day. The opposite would be true. Um, so and again, this is all theoretical, knowing how the body works. Um, and, and I do have some clinical experience with that as well. Wow. Yeah, but I would, I've not seen any any research on that. Yeah, hopefully, you know, you know, as 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 we get more into studying men's health, maybe that's a thing they look at in the future, especially as we 
you know, we everybody has access to these wearables that give you a fairly accurate yeah. measure of your HRV. It's, it's very good. Yeah, it's very good. Um, so you were mentioning, you know, I, I'm all for the the natural ways of increasing testosterone, the sleep, the the resistance training. You had mentioned um, some nootropics, some nutraceuticals. Are there any other supplements that are like, you know, hey, that are kind of like slam dunks for, for testosterone? I don't think there's any slam dunks. Uh, people are all looking for slam dunks. Yeah. People are all looking for the, um, the replacement for Viagra that works the same way, but it's a herb. If you're taking a supplement and it gives you an instant, you know, ability to erect, then that supplement over the counter has a PD5 inhibitor mm. like Viagra, Lefayala, illegally. All right. Because, I mean, I formulated something from male sexual health, and I'm very honest that this is not a replacement for PD5 inhibitors. This builds sexual health. Well, building your sexual are you going to eventually likely perform? And it, yes. But it's, it's, it's a daily thing. You build up that part of your body. It's not event-driven. Um, so, so same thing with testosterone. There is no slam dunk. Sure. Um, and, 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 and I think that's where, I think that's where we get into trouble looking for slam. Oh, I got the vaccine. I got the COVID next. I'm good. I, I got the, yeah, it's good that you have the COVID vaccine, but we're, what we're seeing is that this is a pen, a, a health crisis that's going on because of the obesity rate and metabolic syndrome and things like those are the people that, so what are you doing for that? Right not just the vaccine or the other or slam dunk, dunk one thing. I think it's very important to, to, to look at things holistically. Right. It's the, it's the Burger King and multivitamin guy. It's like, uh, Hey man, I take my multivitamin off to get a Whopper. With a diet Coke. Yeah. Gotta, gotta watch that girly figure. Gotta keep my figure straight. <laughs> Actually, That's right. Uh, 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 something I wanted to ask you about, you know, speaking of testosterone and you're talking about estrogen, um, one topic I see come up, but never really talked about, I don't know what your extent of knowledge is, but something like estrogen dominance, um, you yeah. know, it, it seems to go hand in hand with, um, with metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance. And, uh, you see a lot of guys with this issue, you know, with the, um, you know, it can lead to like the love handles and then of course, lowering testosterone. So, so how do you work with something like estrogen dominance? And maybe if you can explain what estrogen dominance is. You know, estrogen dominance is, uh, and it's mostly associated with females. Mm -hmm. um, when, as I, you know, when I've given talks and I've heard other talks, um, estrogen dominance is where there's an excess amount of, of, of estrogen that's attaching to many receptors in the body, including some uh, other steroid receptors. And it's just a, pre a dominant estrogen load in the body. And oftentimes that, that could be caused by um, the body's exposure to uh, xenoestrogens, right? Estrogens that are from the environment. Um, so then it becomes an overload of estrogen in the body. So again, a lot, a lot of that is um, associated with, with, with well, women. I think in men is the same. Look, I look for testosterone, testosterone estradiol rate, healthy ratios. That's the bottom line. The bottom line is testosterone to estradiol healthy ratio. What's the healthy ratio? I don't know, roughly 20 to 1, 25 to 1, roughly. Mm -hmm. That's what we want, right? You do need estradiol. You don't want too much. Yes, a lot of the prostate issues seem to be associated with an imbalance of that ratio. So too much estrogen relative to testosterone. Mm -hmm. So then now guys have all kinds of prostate issues and, you know, even prostate cancer. That seems to be one of the one of the contributory factors there. And what's the difference between free testosterone and not free testosterone? Because I I, you, I right. see a lot of controversy with that, where you know you have these guys on YouTube like, look at my testosterone, and there's a whole bunch of comments like, that's not as free testosterone. Let's see your free testosterone. And the free testosterone's in the toilet. So like, right. how does that balance work? Right. Yeah, it does take a little bit com a complicated. Um, so steroid hormones in your body, because they are steroid hormones, they cannot roam around your body, right? They cannot roam around your bloodstream because it's almost like fat uh, uh, oil and water doesn't mix. Um, in this case, 
uh, testosterone being the oil, and then your bloodstream being the water. It doesn't mix. So in order for the body to transport testosterone, it needs numerous things. It needs primarily um, sex hormone binding globulin, SHBG. And, and it also binds a little bit to albumin, another protein. So when you look at a blood, at a blood test, it gives you total testosterone. It gives you bioavailable testosterone, which is testosterone that's total plus testosterone that binded to albumin. And then it gives you free testosterone. This testosterone is not bound to anything. So what they're saying uh, on the internet, uh, and be, be, be careful what you, uh, internet is a scary thing, man. Um, you can get, you could get a lot of information that's highly inaccurate and I've seen people get in trouble. Um, so what, what they're saying is that you want, yeah, total, you want good quality, you know, good quantity of free testosterone, not just total, because if you have high total, but it's all bound up to SHBG, then the, the testosterone that does the magic is only free. Mm -hmm. So there is some validity to that. Uh, there is some validity to that. Most of the research still studies mostly total testosterone. With the idea is that if you have good total testosterone, you're going to have a decent, you know, good free testosterone typically. Mm -hmm. Are there instances where total testosterone is good, but free testosterone is low? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. So you have to find ways of, um, of, of freeing up some of that testosterone. Um, you want to know a good herb that I use to free up testosterone? Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, nettle root, nettle root, nettle, nettle root, root is a, is a, a nettle root, not nettle leaves. Very important distinction. Okay. The root, the root has a uh, component in it. That's, um, that's an SHBG inhibitor. The thing mm. that binds to testosterone. Wow. Um, and then, but you need to use it solo. You can't use it in a formula for it to work. So you need to use it, um, alone. And so do you use like, a like a tincture for that? Or is that like a tea you make? I, or? I, I use pills, uh, okay. metal root pills, and I have people take around 500 milligrams twice a day. Okay. Wow. That's, that's amazing. That's very good to know. Thank you. Yeah. So we've, we've talked so much about testosterone. Um, and I, I don't want to not talk about the prostate because I know this is like your, your bread and butter as well. Mm -hmm. Um, what is the number one thing that a guy needs to know about their prostate health? If you do many of the healthy things as you're younger, you are less likely to have prostate issues as you get older. Typically, to, uh, prostate issues occur as a man gets older. Mm -hmm. Not all the time. There are young men who have prostatitis. They're 25 years old, 30 years old. They come in and have prostatitis. That's inflammation of the prostate, and it's brutal because it interferes with their quality of life. Um, it's, it induces pain and induces frequency in urination. Um, they feel like they're 60 and they're 25, 30. Mm -hmm. The quality of life and it, start, you know, it diminishes, and they, they, they have sexual dysfunction as a result of that. Uh, some of it is psychological. Some of it is physiological. Uh, some of them start experiencing more premature ejaculation as it relates to the prostatitis. Um, it, or they get so much pain after ejaculating that there's no, um, they have no desire to be intimate because it's painful afterwards. So prostatitis is a young man's issue. Um, it happens frequently. All other prostate issues, one called BPH or benign prostate hyperplasia, just an increase in size. And prostate cancer typically happen in, um, in older men. So if you do many of the right things, particularly controlling stress, uh, managing stress, a, a lot of the guys that I see with prostatitis are stressed out. Mm. What, you know, chicken or egg, what comes first? Is it that they're stressed out because of the prostatitis or the other way around? I find that the other way around is more very common. They have a stressful type a mentality so that manifests itself uh around the prostate area and the, these type of men so we have to we go over a lot of relaxation things and acupuncture works well for, well for that too wow that's so interesting yeah so if you are down the road then 
of prostatitis. Is there a way to reverse it? <laughs> so, how do you define reversing prostatitis, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's no biomarker that you say, hey, we took a blood draw and this, this chemical came higher and it shows that you have prostatitis. That doesn't exist. So it's really based on symptoms. So the question becomes, can the symptoms be go away completely at, with certain protocols? The answer is yes. But the mind is a very strong and powerful thing. So if they had five years of prostatitis and have gone through the, all this prostatitis, right, for five years, and they've constantly, you know, so then after they start getting better, they don't know what feeling well is anymore. So now, Eric, if, if you start thinking of your pelvic area right now, if you forget that we're having this interview and you, your mind goes to your pelvic area, mm -hmm. I don't know that you necessarily get an erection, but what you will feel is a little tug on the right, a little itch, middle, a little something to the left, right? A little itch. Yep. Right? Right? But you don't even know that's happening because you've never had prostatitis and you're, we're talking, so you're distracted. These people now are hypersensitive to their, so if they're having something similar to what any normal person would have, forget, that will set them off. Oh my God, here it comes again. I feel it on the right. Damn it. And that will set them off. So pure, they get better and then we have to start working up on, hey, listen, you, you are hypersensitive to this. You need a distraction when that happens. Mm -hmm. If it's serious, you got to know. You got to know it's serious. There is no distraction. But oftentimes it will not be serious. You just need to distract, take a couple of you know, breathing exercises and things like that. I will say, not to get too far off track, but this is probably the most real conversation about health I've ever had <laughs> because <laughs> Man, like, that, that's music to my ears. Thanks yeah, so much. And, because I have a lot of these talks, right. And I, 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 yeah. you know, I, I've, this is probably, you know, I've had 30 plus of these podcasts talking to mostly doctors. Cool. I've listened to doctors. I've, you know, I've, I've been to seminars. I've watched webinars. I've done all this stuff. Right. And for the most part, it feels like everyone's saying the kind of the same thing, but like what you said right there is the most, yeah. probably one of the biggest issues that nobody ever talks about, which is we're all doing the WebMD, Dr. Google yeah. self checkup. Yeah. And as soon right. as we read about a thing, we go to Healthline, yeah. people go to my blog, whatever right. it is. And now you put it in your brain that you got it. And the brain is like a nonstop. It's, it's like the worst recording. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I forget <laughs> what the example, uh, there was a, an issue. There was like a, this, this story about the Soviet Union. And there was like, I forget, exa I'm going to mess this story up, but either way, uh, they used to do this thing where to, to, if there was a hostage situation to get the hostage out of the building to like get the hostage takers to let go of the, the people, they would just bring in giant speakers and just blast music on repeat. And there's a story about how they had these hostages in the Soviet union and they wanted to get them out. So they brought in uh, guns and roses, welcome to the jungle. And they just played that on repeat at like the loudest you could imagine for like three straight right. days and a little walk <laughs> of the jungle. That's great. Like one time around for 72 straight hours, that would drive you absolutely insane. And for that's so right. many, like our health issues are so psychosomatic where we're just playing welcome to the jungle on every little thing that right. we got going on in our body. That's right. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that has nothing to do with the conversation, but I just want you to know, like, thank you for keeping it real. That is, that's incredible. You know, I've been, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, the designations after my name become a little bit embarrassing. It's like every letter. And what I learned from that is that you just become more complicated and that doesn't really mean you've mastered the information, right? Um, and I've learned that um, the simple method with teaching and even when with teaching even medical doctors, they want it simple too. Yeah. Medical doctors don't really want to, what's the takeaway? Keep it real. What's a real situation? I, the research is important, but how do I interpret the research and implement it in real life? So the implementation to me is very, it's, it's, it's everything. So, uh, and then is what is it that you're not learning from the books? 
like this notion of hypersensitivity to the pelvic area after process, you're not going to read this anywhere. Yeah. Right. And, and that's e equally or even more important than anything else. Yeah. And let's be honest, like for a man, you know, the, the penis is all, it's all subconscious. It's all psychosomatic. It's like the second, so you, much put, the so second much. you put the wrong thought in your mind, you know, it's like, it's game Look, over. I had, a you know? patient, I had a patient, Eric, just call me like two days ago. Dr. Gio, can you talk really emergency? All right. I'm thinking, you know, COVID-19, he can't breathe. No, I was, this is the first time this ever happened to me. He tells me, first time it ever happened to me. I was bad, you know, I'm having intercourse. In the middle of intercourse, my penis goes flaccid. I was, I didn't ejaculate. What, what is that? Like, and he's like, this is horrible. This is, I was like, all right, take a deep breath. <laughs> take a deep breath. What's happening is that you were not all in in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. You were halfway in. The other half was somewhere else. The other half is you're closing the deal. The other half is with your client. As you're going into the bedroom, if you're 50-50, yeah, you get it hard, maybe. But then in the middle, you're still 50-50, so you go flaccid. You got to be all in, no pun intended, when you're in the bedroom. Yeah. It can't be 80-20, you can maybe get away with 80-20. 50-50, ain't going to happen, man. No. It ain't going to happen. Yeah. You need your own talk show, Dr. Gio. This is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm seriously considering it, actually, Eric. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, you're in New York, and I think everybody's left New York, so there's got to be some studios there to hook yeah. you up. You know, and for nothing, probably for free. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, the prostate, what do we – you know, yeah. Okay. If you're a guy and you're like, okay, thanks. Thanks now for getting me to feel crazy about my prostate. Now you're going to tell me it's no big deal, but now we got to talk about the labs. What, what labs are you looking at? What numbers are you looking at? You know, because we do like, as a guy, like you got to go get your prostate checked. Um, you know, what are you, oh, what are you looking for? What are you looking at? Do you have to get your prostate checked? I don't know. Um, that's just what they say. Yeah. But can you check your own prostate? I don't know. Uh, can, you have a, <laughs> can you have your wife do it for you? Is that yeah. like... Uh, God, yeah, right. <laughs> all, all possible. It's all possible. Sure. Can you check your own prostate? Not really. You need really long arms and the right angle. I haven't known of anybody successfully to successfully check their own prostate. People have tried, believe me. Um, I mean, it is COVID and social it, distancing, so. <laughs> can your wife do it? Yes. And many women do it uh, for, uh, as an erotic because actually, uh, not that I know firsthand, but there is uh, nerves there that are actually very pleasurable. Yes. So I've heard through people that, you know, um, you know partners um, inserting their finger and doing like a prostate massage. Mm -hmm. and, and that's very, very erotic. They feel, you know, it's erotic. So that's that. Um, but they don't really, you know, they don't know what they're feeling. If it's, you know, they don't know what they're looking for. Um, you want me to do it again? Where's the gloves? Oh. Right. Um, again, <laughs> again, with practice, with practice, you get better, you know, we just had chilies. Um, I don't want to do this now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we just had, you know, rice and beans in Puerto Rico. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh man. I want to think about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, not to get too much into the weeds because we can, and I can sure. too, with regards to what to look out for. But here's what I would say. The main biomarker to test for prostate health is called the PSA test. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually about to come up with a book uh, coming out at the end of this month called the PSA book. Okay? Everything about this biomarker. Pretty cool. Oh, sweet. The bottom line is, yeah, I think so. Because I think that it, 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 we joke that PSA stands for not public service announcement, but patient stimulated anxiety mm. um <laughs> but it's none of the above it's prostate specific antigen and it's um so as people will learn if they read the book there is no normal range they do give you a range between zero to four but it's really no normal range it's a it's a number that is age specific so let's say that if you are if you are you know a a 40 year old man should have less than a one. If a 40 year old man has a PSA of two, it's within range, but that's high for a 40 year old man. Mm -hmm. And a 60 year old man can have a PSA of five or, or higher. That may be normal for a 60. So it's age dependent. 
um, velocity of how it changes. So let's say you come to me today, Eric, you're my patient. Um, let's just say um, you are not, I don't think you are, but let's just say you're, I don't know, 42 years old. And, and you come to me today and your patient, uh, your patient, your PSA is, uh, it's 0.5. You come to me next year for a yearly follow-up. Now your PSA at 43, it's 1.5. Mm. Uh, that's a big jump. That's a big jump in a year. You know what, Eric, let me get another PSA in three months, not in a year, because I don't like this jump. You get another PSA three months after that 1.5. Now it's a 2.5. Mm. I'm not liking that increase at all, though you're still within range. So is age dependent, is dependent on velocity, on, on change and things like that. Wow. And are there, are there any um, supplements or foods that are that, like, if you start seeing this kind of uh, increase right. in PSA levels? Right. Um, so by the way, there are, there's a group of drugs called five, um, uh, five alpha reductase inhibitors that falsely lowers PSA. Okay. So you take this and it, and it reduces your PSA by 50%, but that's not a real value. Right. And you know, that's not, that's not indicating that there's no prostate cancer because it's falsely, it's a false, is a false blood negative. Mm. Um, yes, yeah, certain lifestyle and reducing inflammation can help, but you don't want to treat numbers. You want to treat people, just treat people. What's going on? What's it, what's the, the dysfunction here? Uh, or do they, are they having urinary symptoms that are related to their prostate? So then you got to fix that and then the numbers will do what they do. So yeah, there are things that I successfully get, you know, um, um, get PSA at normal levels. Um, but I think that's a side effect of them just being healthier than doing some of the things I recommend, some nutraceuticals and things like that. Right. So what, 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 let's say, you know, they, they're coming to you and they're, you know, they're doing a paleo diet or whatever or they're, you know, they've got their, you know, they're just like, they're just like Joe six pack and they're doing everything, but they've got these high PSA levels or they're worried about their prostate. Like, is there anything that's kind of good? You know, you're not, you're not, obviously this is no slam dunk. You're not swinging for the fences yeah. on this. You're just like, Hey, this isn't a bad idea to, to add, you know, um, vitamin C or whatever the supplement is into your diet. Cause it's good for your prostate. Yeah. Look, there are certain things that are good for the, look, there are things. That, all right. <laughs> if you were to ask anyone who is not, uh, maybe, um, whose expertise is not, you know, men's health and urology, but they've taken botanicals and they've naturopathic doctor. Hey, what's the number one herb for prostate? Mm -hmm. What's the number one herb for prostate? I think everybody would say salt palmetto. Sure. Salt palmetto, of course. So these kind of um, connections of certain herbs, I think black cohosh, which women use for menopause, is amazing for men, actually. So these connections that we've made, uh, you know, salt palmetto has been used for hundreds of years for urinary problems in both men and women, mm -hmm. actually. So I answer that that way by saying there is no like, hey, this is the herb for the prostate. Right. This is no, it's it's things that may have an affinity to the prostate and may reduce chronic inflammation. And by doing so, it reduces PSA and so forth. So I like curcumin, for example. Curcumin is an excellent botanical for that. I like boswellia, which people use for arthritic conditions. I use it for lowering the inflammation of the body and the prostate. I find it is very helpful for the prostate actually. Wow. Um, I, I, you know, I use, um, I use zinc. Um, I think zinc is a very important mineral. Um, do you use uh, zinc uh, in, in isolation or do you pair it? Cause I know like with minerals, something like zinc, yeah. it works with copper and there's like ratios yeah. with magnesium, yeah. things like that. So how, how do you, approach that zinc and uh, zinc uh, uh only i only c uh, couple it with uh copper if i go above 60 milligrams mm -hmm. roughly and then it's like a 60 to 1 ratio roughly um so that's that's that um i give zinc um and you know with vitamin c and alpha lipoic acid and these type of things that seems to work well for the type of patients that i see um Anyway, so to, to kind of put up, uh, to, to conclude on what's the, er what's the supplement of the herb for the prostate, it's sure. not an herb thing. Um, but most people would say salt palmetto, and 
that's fine. I mean, I use salt palmetto to some degree, not all the time, depends on the situation. Got you. I've heard flax yeah, seeds yeah. are good for the prostate too. Is, is that the true? Seeds, the seeds are the oil. No, not. So it's not like you can gulp down a flaxseed oil. The seeds are very good. Yeah. So th that's interesting because I've also heard that flax seeds are high in estrogens and then that can lower your testosterone. Correct. So is, th is there truth to that? You think? Maybe that's why, it loses. first of all, there's estrogenic compounds in many things in nature. Mm -hmm. That's, it is what it is. Um, pomegranate is estrogenic, but pomegranate is actually very good for the prostate. So I don't know if it's because it's estrogenic, you know, s the soy controversy, it's serious. Right. <laughs> the soy, I don't even want to go there, but I think that some soy is fine um, for, for some people. I actually, I think it's fine. But there is phytoestrogenic components to soy. That doesn't mean you feminize. I mean, I think, look, if you start drinking a half a gallon of soy milk a day and so soy ice cream and everything soy, of course, that's a problem. But if you're having, you know, some tofu or tempeh, that's not a problem. It's yeah. likely a good thing. There's probably also some component to like soybean oil and just how much of that stuff is in our sure. processed food and things like that. 100%. Yeah, 100%. That's a whole different... You know, it doesn't even really compare to soy as a food. Right. Soybean oil is a whole different thing um, and um, very problematic and certainly anti-prostate anti friendly. Yeah. So as a urologist um, who deal with dudes, do you see a lot of issues with guys with urinary problems, you know, like you hear about yeah. urinary problems with women, but, you know, I also know that, you know, as guys get older, diabetes or, or metabolic syndrome starts coming in or even younger guys, you know, do you, do you deal with a lot of like urinary issues like that? Yeah, of course, of course. And it is an issue with, uh, uh, I've seen it more and more in younger people. I don't know what the hell is going on, but, it, but definitely I, I see it more amongst uh, older men and, you know, as, as you've noticed already, I like to keep things simple right? When, when, when we start complicating things, nobody wins. If you were to ask me, Dr. Gio, what's the one thing that old men as they age need to do? I said, man, that's a lot of loaded questions. It's a lot of things they need to do to age well. No, 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 gun in my head. No, Dr. Gio, what's the one thing? Eric, I don't know. Dr. Gio, I'm going to shoot you. What's the one thing? All right, all right. Smooth muscle health. Smooth muscle health. That is the one thing. If I have to choose. What do you mean? Well, there's three muscle types in our bodies, right? The skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle for the heart, and then there's smooth muscle. These are the muscles that are not voluntary, and these are the muscles that are involuntary, and they, they, they are the muscles around your bladder, arteries, and prostate, because the prostate, people think is only gland, is 30% muscle. Mm. So these are smooth muscles that are tightly connected to like um, the central nervous system. So if you stress out, right, if you're constantly stressed, what's, happen what's going to happen with your blood pressure? Your blood pressure is going to go up. Why? Because there's chemicals um, attaching to the receptors of the, of the blood vessels that are constricting the blood vessels. That's going to cause your blood pressure to go up. Well, what's going to happen with your bladder? Your bladder is going to go like this. What's going to happen with, with your prostate? Your prostate is going to tighten up, Right. So dealing with smooth, uh, uh, with smooth muscles as you age and making sure smooth muscles stay healthy, that's, 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 that's a major component for men to not have to have all these urinary problems as they get older. So how do you do, so how do, you do that? Is that like Kegels? No, uh, it's lifestyle. Kegels is if you have, um, if you're leaking and you have incontinence and then there's a, there's a muscle there that helps you. If you strengthen it, kind of closes in and you don't, you're not leaking anymore. Mm -hmm. um, you know, outlet stress reduction, anything that helps with stress. I like Nervines as a botanical. Things like scutellaria and lemon balm. These mm -hmm. are Nervines. These relax things. It's good for the smooth muscles. I like kava with guys, some guys with prostatitis, they use kava. Mm. Um, uh, make sure they see. So passion flower and valerian, particularly at night, L-theanine. These are things that relax the smooth muscles. Gotcha. Magnesium, 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 very important. Mm -hmm. So relaxing. So you need 
these things. And you, you need to do stress relieving things and breathe and sleep. You know, sleeping is essential. You sleep well, you sleeping well is very good for your smooth muscles. Right. And so what about the person though, that has the urinary problems that pop up at night, wakes them up while they sleep? You know, what do you, yeah. what do you do with someone like that? So we have to see what the problem is. It could be that the prostate is squeezing in on the, on the urethra. Mm. That's, a, that's one of the main problems in men who have what's called nocturia, right? So it's nighttime urination. Mm -hmm. um, and so then that needs to be addressed. And if it's structural and if it's, you know, we do natural things. Um, and if that doesn't work because they're so far ahead, they need a procedure to open up the prostate and then they could urinate better and they don't, they don't really have urinary, uh, urinary problems at night. Oh, wow. So you probably, so you see that a lot then with guys who it's the urination that wakes them up at night. It's, it's like a structural thing. It's not like a, it's not like a head thing. It's not a kidney thing. It's just like a, like the actual, well, well, see, you, you're opening up a can of worms. You're acting like you have another three hours uh, left of yeah, this yeah. podcast. What All are you right, doing for the rest I of the night? Yeah. It, it, right, exactly. <laughs> All right, so listen. Not, so nighttime urination is nocturia, right? That's mm -hmm. the medical term. It used to be that if a man comes to the office and says, look, I wake it up three, four times a night. Oh, that's, that's associated with overactive bladder or an enlarged prostate. Very likely an enlarged prostate, period, end of story. Here's some prostate drugs. Now, nocturia is his own diagnosis. It's, 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 it's um, disconnected from overactive bladder or prostate. Nocturia can be its own diagnosis. Mm -hmm. No prostate issues, no overactive bladder, just purely nocturia. Period, end of story. Why does that happen? That happens for several reasons. Number one is not that they have a, a urinary problem at night, is that they don't sleep well. So if you're not sleeping well, you get the little urge to go, you go. You're not, you don't go into a deep sleep. Mm -hmm. So sleeping is the problem in some men with nocturia or poor sleep. The literature is also showing that for some people, their kidneys just pumping out more urine at night is a circadian thing. Right. Not in the morning, not in the afternoon. At night, kidneys, you know, pump, pump up all the urine, makes more urine, and then the bladder fills up. And then you have to go. So these are people, they're sleeping fine, no sleep issues, but bladder fills up, they have to go. Right. I, I, what you do, so in naturopathic medicine, right, because medicine is so complicated, we say, all right, let's go back to basics. If you can't treat the area specifically, because, you know, this is not a textbook. Life is, you know, the clinic is not a textbook. Go back to basics. Clean, well, you know, clean eating. Um, don't drink too much fluid, you know, two, three hours before bedtime. Certainly no alcohol or even any fluids, Right. Um, let's do that for exercise, some nu nutrients, right? Things you go back to basics. There is really, for that particular scenario of the kidneys making more urine, I don't know of a, of a, of a treatment just for that, that works well. Got you. That's interesting. Um, one last thing I wanted to ask you about, I know, uh, you've been very generous with your time here. Um, sure. but a thing I see pop up actually in the nootropic space, and I'm wondering if you see this, uh, I would imagine you probably do, um, this thing called PSSD, which is like post SSRI, like sexual disorder. Um, yeah. I literally just started seeing this pop up in the last couple months. Yeah. I didn't know what it was. I just did a brief check on it. I'm wondering yeah. what your experience with that uh, or working with patients with that is. Yeah, it's a thing. It's a thing. So low dose SSRI actually is a treatment for premature ejaculation, right? For some people, it, it triggers them to have ED, right? So not only does it not work for, pre, for premature ejaculation, but it, now they get ED. The fact of the matter is that there are some people that are sensitive to everything to, or to many things. We're metabolically different. Last night I had dinner at a restaurant indoors. Can you believe that? Indoor, I mean, this is the first, this is a big deal. Yeah, in indoor New York, for sure. Dining in New York. 
And at the end of the meal, it was like 9 p.m. I order an espresso. I'm Cuban. This is what we do. Yeah, totally. This is what we do. We, we, there's no time. There's like, no, it's too late. We don't do that. Let's just get an espresso after the meal. Like I said, Doc, you and keep person, it real. And the person who's with me, like, man, I can't, you got to drink an espresso? I'm going to be up all night. I could never do I could never drink coffee after noon. I'm going to go home, do some work, and go to sleep like nothing happened. Right? Metabolically, right? I don't know if it's a Cuban gene. I don't know what it is. Um, there are some people who have post-finasteride syndrome. What, what is that? Finasteride is a type of drug that's used for, that young people use to grow hair at a lower dose. Then older people use at a higher dose for prostate problems. Well, you, then some people start developing ED and a kind of fe they feminize with finasteride. So now you, you, you're growing hair, but you can't do anything with it, right? You can't, you know, because now you're growing hair to look good and, you know, you can't function. So that's, that's called PFS, right? Doesn't happen to everybody, but there's a group of people. So same thing with serotonin SSRIs, same thing. Some people, for whatever reason, it's just a genetic thing, how they metabolize things. They, they, they get some severe adverse uh, events from, from it. So that's that. That's what's going on. Yeah, I see it. And it's, you know, it's tricky because now it starts affecting their brain, their, right. their mind. And once you go there, it's like prostatitis. Remember the scenario? Prostatitis, you're, you're good now, but you're hypersensitive. And once you, right, because it's performance anxiety, right? So now, oh, shit, when I was, you know, taking SSRI, I, I, it didn't work. I went a second time and didn't work. Now you're off SSRIs. You're going in the bedroom with your partner. And you're like, is this going to work now? Man, I don't know. I mean, it's just, once you start on that sympathetic type of mode, mm -hmm. then you're going to have issues. Yeah. So that's, it's tricky. So it almost seems then like a good, and I don't want to say treatment, but like a good way of, of, um, of helping someone with that would be, almost like the same things you would do to like lower stress. So maybe the things you were talking about earlier is things like magnesium and, and things that kind of, you know, you call, I think you call it Nervine uh, supplements. Yeah, ner Nervines or Nervines. Yeah. Nervines. Yeah. 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 I think so. I, I think so. Um, I think it's therapy too. Sure. Therapy helps quite a bit. Yeah. Well, yeah. well this has been, this has been a great uh, discussion. Uh, you know, diving deep into dudes and you're right. Like I need another three hours because there's like, I feel like we just scratched the surface on this. We didn't even talk about cognition, memory and on the, on the holistic nootropic show. We didn't even touch uh, other than ADT related. We didn't even touch it. Uh, uh, cognition. But I think we discovered you as the next Oprah and that's all that matters. <laughs> the next Oprah. Oh man, that's, that sounds good to me. Thanks so much. Yeah. <laughs> what a compliment. Absolutely. Um, so I guess like, you know, before we do sign off, if, if we could just take a quick, like a quick yeah. snapshot, you know, you're working with, you deal with guys and you know, guys like, I don't know, man, I'm moody. My memory's not working well. My brain fog. I know it's complicated, but you know, as a naturopath with your training, like what are you looking at? What are you doing for general guy mood health? Well, I'm looking for to see where their what the, where their stress levels are and where their cortisol is. That's first and foremost very important. And I'm looking at how they live their life, Eric. I spend an hour with every patient, and we really talk. Not a whole lot different. Like you see me, you're saying, "Man, you keep it real." This is how I am with everyone. Uh, it doesn't change. So if I'm in a one-on-one -on -one with a patient, this is exactly what it is. And we start getting to know each other and I start getting to know them. And I, I start getting to know how they, how they function in a day, uh, on their day-to-day -day with their uh, uh, people that are important to them, with them at, at, at their work. And what's, in, you know, this is important, I think, so that you know how they're wired. And, you, and then I start paying attention to what they're not telling me. And I'm able, doing, being a guy, I know what the deal is. And then after doing this work and seeing thousands of patients, I'm able to kind of know what, what they're showing me through their body language, but not telling me yet. And, and then we, we figure things out. So I, I think, and that's very important. Look, 
I've tried, man. I, I've tried to give the one thing. Hey, try this. Hey, try this med. It's pharmaceutical, though I'm not, that's not my thing. But I, or try the med, that re, the, the natural herb that replaces that medication. Here's the one thing. If I have to practice that way, I'll just go and wait tables in Puerto Rico. I'd rather do the right thing. And I think in terms for people to heal and to really get better, you need to, you need to go deep. You need to go to a very deep level. So there is no one thing. There is, we talk, you know, we talk about all these things and then they get a protocol based on the information that they give me. I do look at bloods, you know, labs, and then we look at all that and put a protocol together and that's the way to do it. Yeah, man, this has been so cool. And it's, it's so interesting to talk about guy health with a naturopathic doctor because <laughs> I feel right. like it's the, it's the women who, you know, they monopolize the, the naturopath, you know, yeah. they want to get the, cause naturopaths are really good with hormones and these sorts of things. But you know, what I've noticed is the naturopaths are also now the ones on the forefront of the biohacking, the nootropics, the yeah. anti-aging, right. the longevity, like right. all the coolest stuff. And I don't think guys even know that, you know, you don't have to go to a doctor and be seen for eight minutes and get the thing and then get frustrated when it doesn't work because there are doctors like you who will sit with them for an hour and you can read their body language and you're a dude and you know where a lot of these emotions come from. And right. um, man, I, I just feel like guys need that so much. Thanks so much. I, I appreciate your words there. I, I love what I do. I love what I do. I get messages all the time from my patient and and um there's nothing more rewarding than that this has been one of my favorite uh podcasts i really appreciate you jumping on and uh you know if we can do another round two sometime maybe when your book is out and you you know you want to promote it definitely you're welcome back anytime thanks eric thanks so much listen you and and anyone who listens they're welcome to uh subscribe to drgeo.com i think they'll like if they like this type of stuff this is what i write about and talk about so drgeo.com for you and anyone who's interested. Definitely. We'll, uh, we'll link all that in the show notes and, uh, and give you all the shout outs we can. Um, and hopefully a lot of these people listening, guys, even women follow you. If they're in the New York area, yeah. contact you. I, do you do telehealth as well? Uh, that's, <laughs> that has become the main thing I do now, actually with the one day in the clinic. Yeah. So a lot of telehealth. Amazing. Cool. So we'll link all that in the show notes. And thank you so much, Dr. Gio, for your time. And listener, if you enjoyed this podcast, again, please remember to subscribe, follow Dr. Gio at his website, buy his books. And for all the show notes, check out holisticnootropics.com. Thanks so much for listening and watching. We'll catch you on the next one. Peace. Thanks for listening. For more brain-boosting info, in-depth articles, and show notes, check out holisticnootropics.com.